Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Monday, August 2nd, 2021. On today's episode, we're going to discuss the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editorial Director Peter Soretta. Joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Senior Writer and Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. And Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? Okay, so t- today's episode is going to be a lot about Lord of the Rings, what if, and a little bit about the mo- uh, the MonsterVerse. But let's start things out with Lord of the Rings because this is the big news that hit today. And uh, the Lord of the Rings TV series over at Amazon has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, we now know when we're going to expect this. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, a lot of people, and myself included, were expecting this show to debut on Amazon Prime Video at some point this year, but that is actually not happening. According to Amazon, uh, September 2nd, 2022 is when, quote, a new journey begins with this new Lord of the Rings show, uh, which does not have an official title yet. That's uh, over a year away. It is, yes. Um, it's insane. Which, I mean, they also released a, a first look image uh, of, of this show. And if you take a look at this image, you can probably see why it's still a year away because it's very visual effects heavy. And um, I mean, I know that uh, New Zealand, where they shot Peter Jackson's uh, film trilogies and where they're also shooting this show, does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of creating the aesthetic of Middle Earth. But um, they still need quite a lot of, uh, of enhancements and, and visual effects and things like that. So... Uh, I'm guessing they just, uh, yeah, need a little bit of extra time, a little bit of a buffer there. I know they got shut down like so many other shows did, um, you know, in, in March of last year when COVID was was really uh, hitting for the first time. So, um, yeah, at 2022. So I guess the que- I, I have a bunch of questions here. First of all, do we have a title for the show? Is it Lord of the Rings? It's, it, it's, I can't imagine them calling it the Lord of the Rings. Um, we don't have a title is the short answer, yeah. but uh, it takes place, I think, thousands of years before the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings that, you know, that people are familiar with. So um, I don't think they're also, I, I don't think they're going to call it the Cimmerillion, which is the name of uh, J.R. Tolkien's, like, I think it's called the Legendarium, or like this, this grand, you know, like um, sprawling, uh, almost like, biblical um list of mythology and and mythos and all that kind of stuff i don't think they're going to call it the cimmerillion like the tv show um so no we don't have an official title yet yeah i've heard that book i've had friends who have read that book i you know i picked up that book in a barnes and noble once and i gave up after a page uh i i've heard it described as kind of like a history book or like a bible to the world but like it isn't really a story yeah, I think it's a series of stories. I think I think a history, um, yeah, sort of a history book uh, is the most accurate from my uh, understanding. I have the book on my shelf. My wife has read it. I have not read it yet. I was going to wait <laughs> until, you know, like right before this show begins. But now that I know that it comes out in September of next year, I got a little bit more time before I have to dive into that one. Yeah, so this image that I'm looking at, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a guy on a hill and he's looking – up at this majestic uh, castle. I, I know nothing about Lord of the Rings. I've seen the movies. I've seen, I've read uh, The Hobbit and I love the animated Hobbit and I saw one of those films. Uh, so Ben, w- what am I looking at here? Yeah, we're not really 100% sure. It might not even be a guy uh, in a white cloak. It might be a female character. I'm not sure. Or potentially, you know, some sort of elf or, uh, or <laughs> uh, I mean, who knows? There's 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 a whole host of possibilities there. Um, our own Jeremy Mathai, one of the new uh, news writers at SlashNell.com has written, he's a big Lord of the Rings guy, and he's written this article that I would encourage anybody who cares about this stuff uh, read because it, it breaks down really nicely uh, a lot of the details about when the show is supposed to take place and what might actually be in this image. And again, I've not read the Cimmerillion, so I'm not like super familiar with this stuff, but from what I'm understanding from, from Jeremy's article here, uh, this may be um, like a, th- there are these trees in the background, these really, really, you know, the sun is there and you can, you can sort of faintly see uh, one light and one dark tree. And these are very important trees in the kingdom or the, the area of, uh, of Middle Earth. And these trees, I guess, are, are um, in this area known as Valinor, which, uh, Peter, I mean, it gets into all this sorts of light, light and darkness and, you know, the bringing the light uh, to the world and all this very sort of, um, you know, primal kind of uh, mythological stuff. But um, interestingly, Jeremy uh, sort of theorizes that this image is not the primary setting for the show, that this might be something that takes place in essentially like a prologue, kind of like how we saw in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, how there's like a prologue that details 
um, you know, how Sauron got his hands on the ring and, and the big battle that ensued and all of that kind of stuff. And, and Jeremy thinks that this is like a flashback, you know, set long before the events where the actual show will take place. So he, he breaks that down um, very nicely. If, you, if you're if you curious about this, I, I definitely <laughs> encourage you to read this. Yeah, I know Jeremy kind of theorized that this show could have a lot more of the Silmarillion than most people thought. Like most people thought this was going to be like, more of an original thing but yeah i mean I, I think the idea like that these trees are are visible here and that that sort of like taps more directly into the the mythology that was actually laid down by tolkien instead of just um you know something that that is uh, a store a new story that takes place in his world um if if these trees are what jeremy theorizes <laughs> then i think that's where he's talking about like oh this this stuff might actually have a lot of like you know hardcore stuff from the text that that um you know hardcore fans would recognize okay we'll put the link to jeremy's piece if you want to break it down in depth with a lord of the rings nerd who knows who knows all about this clearly i don't know anything <laughs> Uh, you know, go read Jeremy's piece because it is he, everything he writes is well written and well thought out. Um, but let's uh, let's move over for a second to Marvel's What If. This is a new animated series coming to Disney Plus. It is an adaptation of the comic book series that imagined how things could have gone differently and what those story what those stories would have told. And the first three episodes were given to press, including uh, myself and Brad. Uh, the early buzz has hit the web. Brad, what, before you tell us what you think, before I tell everybody what I think, spoiler free, what what is the buzz online saying? Uh, the early buzz is mostly and overwhelmingly positive. Lots of people like uh, the twists and turns that it puts on the familiar stories and characters of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, it's being, you know, being called essentially Marvel's Twilight Zone. It gets uh, a lot weirder than we, things that we've seen in, in the Marvel movies and the live action TV shows. Um, and yeah, fans are just kind of just having a lot of fun with it, enjoying seeing T'Challa uh, becoming Star-Lord and Peggy Carter becoming Captain Carter, you know, her own version of Captain America. And yeah, so the, the reactions have been very good from these first three episodes. Uh, lots of praise across the board. And by the way, before anybody yells at us, the two things you mentioned are in the trailer. They're in the poster. Uh, they were in actually the Comic Con reveal. I think. Yeah. So um, they're they're not spoilers. They're just the concept, the setups. Um, so Brad, you saw the first three episodes. What what did you think? Uh, I am not as uh, positive or impressed by the series. Uh, it's it's enjoyable enough. It does some interesting things that uh, have an air of mystery about them and put some uh, you know compelling spins on on these stories that uh, I was captivated by, but I feel like because these are only half-hour episodes, the abridged storytelling, it, it kind of makes the story feel disjointed. Like, uh, it expects that you know the the Marvel movies, and so it, it takes shortcuts, but that also undercuts the, the heart and the magic of what makes the Marvel movies so good. Um, it, it doesn't just doesn't, it feels like it's moving too quickly. Like, it, it has to rush through so many things just to get to the end of an episode and make sure it hits all the right uh, plot points in each one. Um, and on top of that, honestly, a lot of these stars from the Marvel Cinematic Universe who are reprising their roles for this show are not great voice actors. Um, they are good in front of a camera, and it's clear like when they have actual moving and stuff to do that they're good, but some of them, uh, it sounds like they literally phoned it in. Uh, and that might be the case due to, you know, the pandemic, that they actually did it over Zoom or something. So maybe that inhibited their performance somewhat rather than being like in a booth with the episode directors and things like that. But uh, yeah, there's some very bland, cardboard, stiff uh, voice acting from from some of the Marvel stars here. Yeah, I think I liked it more than you. I, I did have the same complaint about the voice acting. I know Jacob had the same complaint as well, so I think we're all in the same Oh, and the animation uh, looks, looks – well, it looks great when there are action sequences, but when it's just dealing with characters and looking at their faces, it, it can be kind of weird. Like you're watching a video game that isn't finished because sometimes the dialogue doesn't feel like it matches very well to the mouse because it feels like it's kind of going for mm. a slightly more – realistic version of the animation style from spider-man into the spider-verse um so it sometimes it feels a little clunky but when it's doing action sequences it is 
smooth and crisp and looks uh, outstanding. Yeah. Um, I thought the action was great. Uh, the, this series is directed by a guy that's been storyboarding the action scenes of the live action film since the Avengers. And, you know, uh, the comic books, which I, I, I've said on this podcast, have been some of my favorite comic books, uh, were just so fun, but they were all sold on a premise of like, you know, what if the X-Men had died or whatever. And I think... The interesting thing here is that because these are released weekly and we aren't having to buy the comic books on a rack, they kind of don't have to reveal their premise right away. So sometimes it's kind of like a Black Mirror episode where you're kind of waiting to figure out what the what the the change is, if that makes sense. What, what is the twist? What is the inciting incident that created this multiverse? Um and I do think the good and bad of the show is it's based on those Marvel movies. So it's good that because it's based on like um, these moments from the MCU canon that we've all seen and mainstream audiences know. But the bad part about that is there really isn't that many Marvel movies. So I'm already with three episodes feeling like they're going to run out of like material to subvert. Um, and I do think that the order of the episodes felt really weird. Like, uh, I really got into it in the third episode and I feel like, uh, have they said, are, are they going to release more than one episode in the first week? Uh, I, they, ha they haven't yeah. said, but I don't think so. Eh, I, I feel like some people are going to watch that first episode and be like, I'm out when the show seems like it's a gradual build, which we'll talk about later. But, um, yeah, I'm still in. I still liked it. Are, are you going to watch more? Yeah, I'm going to watch more just because there are elements that I'm curious about to see how they unfold, especially after talking to uh, the director and writer and executive producer over the weekend for a press event. So, uh, yeah, I will, I'll see what else happens um, on the show just because my curiosity is too strong to stay away from it. Okay, before we get into some more what if stuff, I want to take a left turn to Warner Brothers Monsterverse uh, because writer Max Bornstein uh, he wrote uh, some of the Godzilla and Kong movies, and he he recently did an interview talking about uh, the possibility of doing one of these monster movies without any of the pesky humans. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, our own Jack Jeru sat down with uh, with Max Borenstein to talk about the potential of like you know whether or not such a thing would even be possible. And uh, Borenstein says, "I do think it could be done. I was thinking about the same thing. I think it would be amazing, actually." Um, you know, that's his quote. I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure if that means that he's really you know legitimately conceiving this as a thing to really pitch to Legendary. I just think. He's thinking almost more in like hypotheticals here. Um, but he does say, given the success of Godzilla versus Kong, I'm kind of hoping whatever the next phase Legendary decides to do, uh, that we would see that. I think it'd be pretty cool. I think it's possible. It would be very ambitious. I think ambitious in that Mad Max Fury Road way. I think it's totally possible to do that with the absolute minimum amount of human characters and really characterize the creatures. Um, so he even says in that quote, you know, the, the minimum amount of human characters, I'm guessing that's more than zero. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just because that would be maybe too bold for a major studio to do. Although, I, you know, conceptually, I love the idea. I, I would really love that. I mean, I've been talking about that for years. I feel like I've read somewhere a long time ago, maybe Ridley Scott or, or one of the writers around the time that Prometheus and Alien, versus Co or, uh, Alien Covenant was coming out that like, what if there was an alien movie that didn't have any humans? And I just like fell in love with the, I, the concept of that, like how... Um, mesmerizing and, and enthralling that would be and, and just different than all the other franchise filmmaking that we've seen over the past X number of years. Um, so yeah, I, I would love it if they were actually to full on embrace that kind of thing. I just don't think, I, I think it's like too, um, too out there, too far out there yeah. for a major studio to do. Yeah, I, I think this quote doesn't really suggest that anything is in the works. It seems more of uh, Max answering <laughs> Jack's question. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we can all agree that the humans are oftentimes the worst part of these like disaster movies. And I, you know, when we went into the the Planet of the Apes trilogy, uh, you know, in recent years, that that series got more to be based on the the CG ape characters than it did the human characters, and I actually enjoyed it more. 
when when they kind of veered away from the humans. Uh, Brad, what are your thoughts on this? I, I I I kind of brought this up in the the podcast. Not so much of like this is big news or anything. Like you know, obviously nothing's happening out of this. This is just a quote that uh, the writer gave us. But do you think that uh, do you think that Hollywood needs human characters for for mainstream audiences to care about these big like monster movies, or like do you think that's backwards thinking? Um, I don't think that it needs them, but they probably I don't know. The problem with making a, a Godzilla versus Kong movie without any humans is that like you you're not really going to have any dialogue, and can having two monsters on screen for an entire runtime sustain the audience you know obviously the audience is there to see those two monsters uh go at it but like you're essentially talking about watching you know what amounts to uh i I guess you know like you you could watch it without any you know sound on and still understand what's going on probably since the monsters you know can't talk or communicate or anything other than roaring and beating each other up so i think that you need at least maybe like a sparing use of humans to you know, provide a sense of exposition and at least, you know, give some kind of human perspective on what's happening, you know? And I think the problem is, is that. But they're often used as like the, the characters that we're supposed to care about, not giving well, perspective. Well, that's what I was going to say is I, is so far, like they've used character, human characters too much to where like they're, they're trying to make them the focus and give them something to do that they don't really need to do in a movie like this. So like if they were, made to function just as plot devices, you know, or something like that, that helps push, push the story along and allows the monsters to shine on their own. Then I think that that's fine, but no one really has, has made a monster movie without making the humans like trying to make them an important part of the story. Uh, yeah. When, when I spoke with um, Borenstein around the time that got Zill versus Kong came out earlier this year, he mentioned uh, John C. Riley's character in Kong skull Island, which I think is a, a really great example of like, a character who knows an, an actor who's playing a character who knows that he is fully secondary to these giant creatures who like everybody is clearly there to see. Um, and that character I think is really well written and has like a lot of, you know, jokes and stuff, obviously, but there's like a real soul to that character. And I'm not sure. I mean, maybe if there's just a way to, um, to cut down on like some of the square jawed leading man stuff that just gets a little boring and, and maybe just populate movies like this with, uh, more eccentric characters like John C. Riley's character in that film, and maybe um, maybe it wouldn't feel so uh, cardboardy and, and just sort of boring whenever those those big creatures are not on the screen. You know, agreed. Okay, uh, we're we're gonna go back to what if for for a bit here, and I think we might get into I don't want to say spoilers, but speculation. Brad, how, how do you want to preface this? Uh, for people that might not want to know. I would say maybe a little bit of a spoiler, but like not much. So like there's a lot more speculation here than anything because the stuff we'll talk about has been shown in the trailers. Like there's one little tidbit here that hasn't been fully laid out in the marketing, which some might consider a spoiler. So if you're very sensitive to that kind of thing and you, you like you're you're prone to complain about learning anything about a show before it comes <laughs> out, I would say go away. But otherwise we're not like giving anything huge uh away here. Yeah, we're actually not even giving away anything that we have seen in the first three episodes. This is stuff that the filmmakers and the people involved uh have you know offered up themselves in interviews from the junket so they're using it to promote the series so you judge on your own if you want to continue with this podcast or not but uh if you don't you can you can see yourself out right now um okay um a lot of people have been speculating including ourselves this what if animated series might actually not be this you know anthology thing that we we think it is and it could actually be connected to the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe, the the movies and the TV shows, and we we've kind of theorized, theorized on how that could be. And at this junket, we got some answers. Brad, tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, it's not we're not getting any like major confirmation about like things from What If coming into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's clear that What If is the direct result of the events that unfolded. Um, in Loki, because uh, executive producer 
uh, Brad Winderbaum said during the, a press conference over the weekend that, that I attended that, uh, quote, it's no coincidence that the show picks up right after Loki. The multiverse has erupted in every possible direction. What if gives us a chance to explore that? Um, and he can emphasize that um, he said, continue to quote, I think that without going into great detail, I can tell you that what if as a project, as a story that exists in the MCU is as important as any other and is woven into that tapestry. And under normal circumstances, I would say maybe that's him just like being proud of a show and not wanting to put it like on a lower tier, like, hey, this isn't as important as, you know, a Marvel movie or, a, you know, the Disney Plus TV shows we've seen so far. But I did ask him if like the show is meant to be like a guide as to show audiences what the multiverse like means as far as like its impact on the Marvel Cinematic Universe and what is possible within it, or if it's meant to have things that are referenced and carried over into the movies and TV shows. And he said, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. So it sounds like there's a mm. possibility that maybe things that are in this series could end up appearing in future projects. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's something like Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness. Um, but, and then uh, getting, digging more specifically into what if we've talked about how that maybe there might be some more connective tissue between these episodes in this first season, because the trailer for what if that was released not too long ago um, has a shot where we see uh, an assembly of, these different versions of Marvel characters that are basically in the same position as the Avengers were in the final battle in New York with that, that iconic, you know, 360 shot circling around all of them as they kind of assemble for the first time. And in that shot in what if we see Eric Killmonger as black Panther, uh, Peggy Carter as captain Carter, uh, Gamora, Thor and T'Challa as star Lord. And so I, I asked if there was, you know, this idea of like leading to something bigger that is, you know, beyond an anthology series. And uh, he played Brad Winderbaum kind of played things close to the vest. And he said, cool, I don't want to go into spoiler territory, but there's a particular concept we were excited about in the first season that allowed us to think about the multiverse with the new lens and potentially offer us some connectivity between the episodes. Um, besides, uh, so I feel like there's probably going to be an explanation as to how these characters come together. And I'm basing that on, something that happens at the end of the first episode of what if, which it, which is the episode focusing on captain Carter. And I won't say what that is. I'll right. let you find that out yourself when you watch the show, but it does provide a glimpse into the, the ways in which the different versions of these characters can come together, which is important because I also asked uh, bread Winderbaum if each of these episodes is meant to be a separate universe in the MCU. And he told me, quote, each episode is essentially a separate universe. So you can see the moment when, to use Loki terminology, when the universe branches. And each episode explores uh, a story in one of those branches sometime after that point, where it diverges away from the sacred timeline. So that means each episode, it's, it is technically an anthology, but that doesn't preclude these characters from somehow venturing into each other's universes. Well, that's going to be interesting because I feel like my my biggest criticism of the show so far is the the unconnected nature of it. Yeah. It kind of feels disposable in a way that these stories are just singular, and it you know you, you end it and the the watchers like, and that's the end of that story. You know I thought I mean? about that too, but I also thought about how the first few movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe before it was even called the Marvel Cinematic Universe were not connected in such a such a yeah. way that they are today you know um there was some connective tissue by way of nick fury and agent colson but thor captain america iron man they all had their own adventures and stories that didn't really have an impact on each other so i feel like since if, if they're trying to do a new assembly of the avengers with this series that they're probably doing the same thing here and they're trying to keep it a little more low-key before they get into starting to connect uh, all these episodes and characters together. Yeah. Brad, I have a question. Uh, based on that quote that you read most recently, the one where he was talking about the sacred timeline, do you think in a scenario in which, uh, let's say in Dr. Strange 2, uh, the multiverse opens up and, and Benedict Cumberbatch's live action Dr. Strange goes into a different universe, right? And that universe happens to be the 
uh, you know, one of these branches that is depicted in this what if show, does that mean that, do you think the live action character would be interacting with animated characters like who framed Roger Rabbit? Or do you think that, that uh, Cumberbatch's live action, Dr. Mm-hmm. Strange would then himself be animated because that's what the world looks like. Does that make It does make sense. sense. Um, from my perspective, I would imagine that them using animation to del- tell these stories is more of a creative decision than one uh, as far as like it's easier to tell this kind of story and cheaper to do it like this. And that if they were to bring elements in from what if they would probably be made into live action instead of live action characters mm. becoming animated. I don't think we'll ever get a who framed Roger Rabbit live action animation <laughs> hybrid, you know, because even though Marvel has been getting weird, they haven't gotten quite that weird yet. Even even having Miss Minutes in Loki, she's she's an animated character, but she's not technically a cartoon in that world, you know. Um, so right, I, right. I have I have a feeling that it would if they did anything, they would turn those animated elements into a live action thing. Yeah, interestingly, another question came up at the junket uh, about rejected ideas, and it was revealed that one of the ideas that they came up with was thrown out because it was deemed to be half the plot of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, ben, tell us about that. Yeah, so AC Bradley, who's the head writer of What If, um, did a, an interview recently where basically she was just talking about, um, yeah, she, she she basically pitched some ideas that were um, that ended up being like a little bit too on the nose. She, so she asked Brian Andrews, the director, uh, if one of these ideas, if, if uh, Andrews thought that Kevin Feige would approve of it, and, and Andrews' response was, oh yeah, Kevin would love that. That's half the plot of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. <laughs> um, and it actually is the, not the first time that Bradley has done something like this. So long before she saw Avengers Endgame, she evidently pitched the idea of uh, old man Steve Rogers and Professor Hulk. Um, and then she also previously pitched uh, the Jane Foster version of Thor and was told no about that. And she like, went into this whole <laughs> feminist rant of why characters are important and all of that. And and like uh, female characters are important and why a woman needs to be able to wield the hammer. And they were like, yeah, we, we're just saying no because we're actually doing it already in live action. Like That's already in the works. So um, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds, uh, that sounds kind of cool. And it sounds like she has a pretty good handle on, uh, the Guardians characters, because um, like the, the whole point of her uh, quote, she says, uh, when it came to creating the first 10 episodes of season one, ironically, the first question was not what if the first question was, let's take all these heroes and figure out what makes them tick. So, um, you know, tracking down, like getting to the actual heart of, of who these characters were, that's the that's what led uh, AAC Bradley to to pitch that story that ended up being you know, like pretty much essentially what James Gunn is working on for Guardians Volume 3. That is very curious because I wonder what what could you do with Guardians of the Galaxy? Well, we don't even know if they're doing uh, that. Her pitch was uh, the pitch was with um, for the Guardians. It was just that it was too similar to the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. I'm assuming. Oh, I see what you're saying. I, I'm assuming it had saying. the Guardians, though, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, probably. And it, yeah, it's, it sort of reminds me of like um, I remember when you interviewed um, Ryan Johnson for The Last Jedi, Peter, and, and he was talking about like the way that he came at telling that story was breaking down these characters to like their core um, wants and needs and like what is the worst thing that could happen to each of these individual characters and then like putting them through the ringer with with like forcing them to face that situation head on. Um, so that that sort of like character breakdown kind of thing seems like something that could work. You know, I, I can see how, um, you know, two smart storytellers yeah. could come to similar ideas by doing that kind of thing, you know, based on uh, what we know of these characters so far. I'm curious what this means for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. But that brings us to the end of today's Slash Film Daily. You can find more of all of our work at SlashFilm.com. You can find this podcast on Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popcorn podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to Peter at SlashFilm.com. And please, if you like this podcast, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Write us a sentence or two saying and telling people why you like this podcast. Give us five stars. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>